Professor Patra, I think we can start. Uh, okay, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today, on behalf of uh, Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, NIT Raukela, and uh, Indian Institute of Metals Raukela Student Chapter, we are privileged that we have with us uh, Professor Brian Cantor for today's distinguished lecture. And this distinguished lecture is a part of uh, NIT Raukella's uh, uh, Diamond Jubilee celebration. And uh, I would uh, also uh, like to uh, express my gratitude thanks to Professor Brian Cantor that he has uh, agreed our invitations and uh, will be enlightening us with his uh, gracious presence. And uh, with these few words, I would now like to request uh, Professor Anindu Basu, head of the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, NIT Raukella, to uh, say a few words uh, about Professor Brian Cantor prior to his distinguished lecture. Sir, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Patra. So on behalf of the department and the institute, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Cantor uh, in this prestigious uh, lecture series. Uh, to celebrate our Diamond Jubilee of the Institute. And uh, this is also uh, co-organized by uh, Indian Institute of Metal, our regular student chapter. So as a customary, I should give a brief introduction of the speaker, but uh, who are in the field of high entropy alloy, um, for them it is uh, just uh, the basic, I should tell. So Professor Cantor is an emeritus professor in the Department of Materials at the University of Oxford and a research professor in the Brunel Center for Advanced Certification Technology at Brunel University. Earlier, he was vice chancellor of the University of York and Bradford University, head of the mathematical and physical science at the University of Oxford, a research scientist and engineer at General Electrical Research Labs, USA, and also worked briefly at Benaras Hindi University, um, India, Washington State University, Northeastern, and ISC Bangalore, India, and Kobe Institute. He founded and built up the World Technology Universities uh, Network, the UK National Science Learning Center, the Hall York Medical School, Science City, York, Oxford's Big Brooks Science Park, the Digital Health Enterprise Zone, and the UK RI Circular Metal Research Center. He was a long-standing consultant for Elkan, NASA, and Rolls-Royce, trustee of the Science Museum Group, and editor of Progress in Material Science. He invented the new field of multi-component high-entropy alloys and discovered the famous so-called Cantor alloys. So with this brief introduction, I will uh, like to welcome again Professor Cantor uh, for his today's work. So now this is... Uh, the dais is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, for, thank you very much, Professor Basu, for a wonderful Don't introduction. Thank you very much, Professor Patra, for the initial invitation. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, National Institute of Technology in uh, Rokola and the Indian Institute of Metals for inviting me to this uh, rather uh, distinguished lecture. I feel very honoured to be, be invited, and I'm looking forward to giving my lecture. I We'll just start by saying I've had long associations with India. Um, I first worked in India in 1979, um, which uh, in 80, which uh, was when I worked at Banaras Hindu University a long, long time ago. And I fell in love with India and I've been visiting ever since, but I have to apologize. I have never visited R Rokola, um, but uh, perhaps I can do that uh, one day in the future. Anyway, I have lots of uh, excellent uh, Indian friends and colleagues. Um, as I have all around the world. So let me share my screen and I'll go to give my presentation. Is that okay? Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Good. That's great. Well, thank you very much again for the, the very kind introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as uh, Professor Abaja said, um, I'm, uh, Basu said, I'm uh, Brian Cantor. I'm uh, 
a professor at the Department of Materials at Oxford uh, and a professor also at uh, the Research Institute BCAST at Brunel University. I'm going to talk about multi-component high entropy Cantor alloys. Uh, before I start, let me mention that uh, last year I published uh, my uh, textbook uh, for really for first year students and starters, uh, leaving school students, uh, early first year undergraduate students uh, to enthuse people about materials. So very accessible um, on the simple equations of materials. It's the, it describes the, the base, some of the basic equations and gives unusually biographies of the scientists who develop them. So if you're interested, do have a look at it. It's there. It's priced for students to be able to buy it. Anyway, let me move on to my uh, my lecture. So I have uh, three main messages for you in this lecture. The first, le first message is that human history is the history of new materials. That's to say humankind's development has been driven always by the discovery and the implementation and the use of new materials. Um, all of humankind's developments have been developed by uh, new, uh, driven by new materials, which uh, I will uh, persuade you of in a minute. Secondly, that all materials are alloys. All real materials, in fact, pretty much all materials uh, we can imagine are alloys. That means that they are mixtures of other materials in a non-technical language. In technical language, we call the, the, uh, the things they're made of components. So we mix up different components to make up... Uh, um, uh, alloys, mixtures of materials. And I shall regard, regard the words materials and alloys as more or less the same thing, really. And then thirdly, that there are gazillions of materials. Uh, gazillions is not a technical word, uh, but it implies a lot. And I do mean a very lot, a la very large number of materials. I will give a definition of gazillions uh, when we get into the talk. But I'm going to start with a brief history for about 10 minutes or so of humankind to persuade you that uh, all, all humankind's uh, advances have come about by the development of materials, new materials, and that all materials are alloys. So uh, humankind emerged about two and a half to three million years ago at the beginning of the uh, last ice age. It's also the beginning of the stone age. All these three things, all these things coincide. The beginning of the ice age, uh, the emergence of humans who evolved from uh, apes, southern apes, Australopithecus, um, and the beginning of the Stone Age, and they're all linked. What happened is the weather got worse with the Ice Age, and it became advantageous for apes to evolve, to have better brains, become humans, for humans to evolve, because they could then make tools um, in or, and weapons, in, uh, but mainly tools, in order to be able to hunt animals and, uh, and cut down uh, plants more efficiently uh, given the difficulties of get finding food in the uh, with the poorer weather, so they they be so humans evolved and they were they were called Homo habilis, that's to say tool making humans, and uh, they began to make. Um, uh, I'm just going to get my uh, pointer working. So here is a picture of an early flint tool from a couple of, from two and a half a couple of million years ago. Um, and uh, the, the, the early tools were made by finding flints and stones and fracturing them to create sharp uh, points like this. Um, the flints and stones they used are alloys. They're mainly silica, silicon oxide, um, but they have small amounts of uh, calcium oxide and magnesium oxide and iron oxide, which is what produces the flaws, which allows them to be able to be uh, fractured into, to make them into tools. Um, so they're alloys uh, already. They're natural, naturally found alloys. Of course, the whole world is made up of oxide alloys. The Earth's crust is basically a large mix of different oxides. Uh, everything's oxidized because the atmosphere in the world has oxygen, so everything gets oxidized. Um, and, uh, uh, most, most elements uh, uh, reduce their, almost all elements reduce their energy if they oxidize. So the world is a, is a massive uh, oxide alloy, basically, on, the, on its surface. Um, and the found stones we use for making flints, or early humans did, uh, were silica with a small amount of alloying additions. Now, most of the last two and a half to three million years was in the last ice age. It's, uh, you may not know this, but more than 95% of that, more than 99.5% of that time was the ice age. So almost all of that period, we were in the Ice Age and 
and early humans uh, went around a bit like apes in small groups, uh, hunting animals and and, uh, and and cutting down plants for their food. And at the end of the Ice Age, uh, took place 12,000 years ago. Um, that's 10,000 BC. Uh, and that's the end of the Ice Age. And it's also the end of the early Stone Age, the Paleolithic, and the beginning of the new Stone Age, the Neolithic. But it's also, most importantly, the point at which we have what's called the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution is when humans stop going around like apes still do in small groups, just hunting uh, animals for their food and cutting down plants for their food, um, and started to settle in small communities, small farming communities. Um, it's called the agricultural revolution because it's seen the, the, the big changes that they, be, they, they domesticated plants and they domesticated animals to allow for a settled farming existence. It was more comfortable to be settled. You didn't have to be nomadic. You didn't have to be hunter-gatherers. Um, but, you know, although the emphasis is always placed on the agricultural development and the farming, the, it's, called, it's often called the biggest change in human existence ever. Um, but it, the real driver was a development in the materials capability because it, it came with the discovery of how to fire clay. So clays are other, again, oxide mixtures of uh, soils and, uh, and sands that are found, um, and they're basically aluminosilicates. That's alloys of aluminum oxide, alumina, and silica, silicon oxide, silica, with, with mixtures of other uh, oxides in as well. Uh, they're mixed with water, made into shapes, then heated up and fired, and you can make objects then and shape them. That discovery um, was essential to allowing uh, the uh, agricultural revolution, the farming uh, developments, and the domestication of plants and animals, because you, you had to have uh, permanent dwellings. And it's firing of clays, which allows you to make bricks um, in order to, um, to make dwellings that people can live in, but even more important, to make pottery, to make pots to store the food. There is no point having a farming community unless you can store the food. So it was the development of new alloys, the clays that could be fired, in, by heating them in fires in what, what are called kilns, just fires really, um, which, uh, which, which drove the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BC. Now we come forward about 6,000 years from that to about 4,000 BC, and um, the fires got a bit better, um, and people uh, began to discover that you could smelt metals and they didn't know what smelting was, and they didn't know what metals were, of course, at first. But if you light a fire or a kiln to make it to to uh, to make your pottery or to or to heat you up um, on top of a metal ore, then the carbon in the wood to make the fire will oxid will will reduce the oxide in the ore or the sulfide if it's a sulfide ore. But most most ores are oxides, and and metal will be re re produced. That's called smelting. And um, so metal would be found oozing out at the bottom occasionally of the fires of the early Stone Age and uh, 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 people in the Neolithic times. Um, and they must have been amazed to see these shiny metals appearing. And at first, um, this was not much of much use because uh, metals are very soft um, and they're not really much uh, use uh, when, they, when they're formed purely by smelting like that. Um, so they were used for decoration, uh, lead, tin, copper, were discovered and used for decoration uh, and for jewelry, jewelry, that kind of thing, and um, for just decorative purposes. Um, until uh, 4000 BC, um, when it was discovered that if you alloy copper with a little bit of tin, and this had to be a discovery because copper and tin ores are not found together, and um, so if you alloy a few percent of tin into copper, you get a, a much better material. It's strong as well as being formable. So just like all metals, it can be formed, it can be hammered into shape, but it can also be cast into shape. So you can have wrought alloys, you can have cast alloys, and but you can also have strong alloys because you add the tin to the copper. So that's what bronze is. And now that led to the growth of um, an amazing growth, because instead of small farming communities, suddenly you get the growth of enormous big civilizations, organized empires. And the reason for that is it needed trade to, to move the tin and the copper around and to have in, in, almost indus, indus, in early industrial development to manufacture the bronze. And this required organization. It required societal organization. It led to the growth of cities, 
the cities developed at that time, and you start to get these big Bronze Age civilizations growing up. The Mayan civilization in, in uh, Latin America, the uh, Shang dynasty in China, and the Harappa um, uh, developments in India, uh, uh, most notably probably the pharaohs in Egypt and all the Egyptian civilizations and the Greeks as well. All Bronze Age civilizations, great mushrooming of, uh, of organization and development and trade. Um, now we and here's a picture of a, uh, a, a bronze dagger from about uh, 2000, B, between 1500 and 2000 BC. Um, and this, these kilns and the bronze would be made in, in fires that were, this is a, an early copper smelting hearth, and it looks pretty much like a fire you would make if you went out camping with your, with your friends and wanted to build a fire. It's just stones in a circle. Um, but fire technology improved. So we jump forward about uh, another three or 4,000 years to 1500 BC, and suddenly the fires got better and it became possible to melt iron. And that's when we move into the Iron Age. So we move from the Bronze Age with the alloy of copper and tin to the Iron Age, which are alloys of iron and carbon. Now, here is a picture. What the key development in, in furnace technology, this is a, a painting on a Greek vase, and you can see uh, the key development is putting a chimney on a fire. When you put a chimney on a fire, it gets hotter. It's more efficient. Um, and so people began to do that to, to have more efficient uh, smell. Um, uh, firing of, uh, of pottery and uh, develop and, uh, and, and and smelting of copper and so on, uh, but they suddenly discovered they could smell iron, which they didn't even know really existed before. Um, now, uh, the key difference with iron is, unlike copper or tin or lead, iron dissolves carbon from the wood into it, and you then get wrought iron, well, cast iron first of all, and wrought iron. So here's a picture of uh, a painting of a, of, a, of a blacksmith about to take some iron, an iron bull out of a an early smelting furnace uh, for iron, and he's going to hammer it and turn it into tools like this, which will then be used. And of course, iron, cast iron, which is uh, and wrought iron, which is iron with one or two or three percent carbon, is a much better material than than bronze. So you can make much stronger and better tools and weapons. And all of those Bronze Age civilizations collapsed at that point, and they were replaced by Iron Age civilizations. The people who developed the iron technology took over the world. Um, this, this, the, the early Qi dynasty in China, which, is, which China is named after, uh, is an example. But the most famous example is, of course, the Roman Empire, which took over much of, the, much of the world, the known world at that time. And it was an Iron Age development which allowed them to do it. Um, so, uh, um, so that was the Iron Age. And we move on uh, to the 18th century. The next major development in humankind was the Industrial Revolution, often called the second um, most uh, important uh, development in humankind, the uh, Industrial Revolution, which was, the discover which was, of course, the discovery of how to make things by industrial production. It was based on scientific revolution in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, that was then all implemented into machinery, into industrial production, into making large quantities of things. It began with textile machinery and the manufacture uh, on large scale of, uh, of clothes and of, uh, of carpets and, and rugs and things like that. Uh, but it then moved into making so many other things and gradually built up. And the key development in, to allow, what it led to, of course, industrialization led to taking people from what were effectively starvation or near subsistence economies into economies of wealth. People, uh, people having a disposable income, being able to live comfortably. And of course, not all the world has yet had its industrial revolution. It began in, in Britain in the 18th and 19th, in the 18th century, gradually moved to Europe and other parts of the world in the 19th century, uh, America and some parts of the Far East, uh, in Eastern Asia. Um, but gradually, has, even in, out into modern times, um, uh, the industrial development uh, has taken place. There's still probably about a third of the world not yet industrialized, but most of the world has uh, seen an industrial revolution, and it's led to the sort of modern comforts that most of the middle class people in the world uh, are able to, to have. It led to all the developments of things like electricity and power um, and the um, um, equipment and machinery that you can have, you know, the housing goods that people have to live comfortable existences, the roads and the uh, transport developments with uh, with cars and boats and planes and trains, 
uh, electricity, uh, communications, all of these things came with the Industrial Revolution. And the key material development, though, was the discovery of how to make steel. The precision needed for the equipment and the machinery and the engines used in the industrial uh, in the industrial period and to, for the manufacture and then in the use, the machines have to be much more precise. And, and cast and wrought iron and bronzes are not good enough. You have to have a better quality of material. And it was the discovery that if you blow a bit of air back through uh, molten uh, iron with, with its few percent of carbon in it to oxidize out most of the carbon by a peculiar iron, uh, ir irony, um, um, steel is a more pure form of iron than what's called an iron. Uh, irons are uh, iron, uh, the element iron with a few percent of carbon in them, and steels are iron with just 0.1 to 0.8 percent of carbon. And you get a much more, uh, much better combination of strength and formability, ductility, and fracture resistance, which is related to formability. I'll say something about that in a second. But uh, here are two examples. And um, so, if you have 0.8% carbon, you get a perlitic steel like this. It consists of iron with a small, equal amounts of uh, the, these these plates. Uh, these these uh, lines are plates of, uh, of pure of iron and a, a, car, a compound called cementite. Uh, an iron carbide, um, which gives the hardness and the strength. And it's about 50-50, the two uh, components. And when hammered into beautiful things like these Damascus steel knives, you can see that these lines come from the, the structure of the material at a much uh, finer scale. Um, so this is at the top end, where you get high strength, which is what you want for a knife, but still you can form it into a nice shape. Um, at the low end, 0.1% carbon, the amount of cementite is much less, so you get much more formability and softness from the iron, but you uh, still have enough hardness, and you can make things like these beautiful car shapes from the 1950s, the so-called golden era of beautiful cars. And um, So everything depended upon having uh, this, this wonderful new material, steel. Now we move forward to the modern era. We li we're living in what's called the... Th the Industrial Revolution is often called the second biggest change in human existence after the Agricultural Revolution, and we're living in what's called the third biggest change, the Information Revolution. But of course, the Information Revolution, we're in the middle of it, but it depends on alloying, micro-alloying, doping of silicon. So here is a person who's uh, just manufactured or brought, brought out of the furnace um, a uh, silicon single crystal about, two, about a meter, two meters high, and about 200 millimeters diameter, an amazing, uh, amazing piece of uh, technology. It's uh, it's one single crystal, and it's probably got uh, parts per billion purity. Um, it's got incredibly low levels of impurity. And um, this is then nowadays they're made two or three times bigger than this. They're then cut into thin wafers like this, um, and each wafer will have literally hundreds like this of silicon chips made on the surface. A thin wafer cut from this will be hundreds of wafers from this. And each wafer will have hundreds of silicon chips. And each of these little squares is a silicon chip. And each silicon chip will have literally millions and millions and millions of transistors in it to give the functionality of the silicon chips and produce the information handling capability, which leads to the information revolution. And, and just to give you an idea, there's hundreds, so there's, there's hundreds of these silicon chips. Eight, the, nowadays, the maximum number of transistors a silicon chip can have is about 60 billion. So this is an amazing feat of microscopic, incredibly high purity engineering. Here's a picture of a single transistor region. This is this distance here is about 10 atoms. And these different regions have been doped differently with phosphorus and boron and aluminium at parts per million levels into the silicon to give it the functionality. So the engineering feat to do this is massive. And of course, it's what gives us the information capability to provide the uh, all the computation we now use to to, to organize everything. Uh, it allows uh, the lectures like this to take place over the internet. It allows the internet, it allows social media, telecommunications, and so many other things yet to come. So that's the first section of my talk. I hope I have persuaded you that uh, all humankind's development has occurred through the development of new materials. And I hope I've persuaded you that new materials are alloys, they're mixtures of other uh, materials. Um, now, despite the wonders that have been developed in all of this, everything has been done by using what I call conventional alloying strategy. What that means is we pick, pick one major component for the main property 
and add a small amount of alloying additions for secondary properties. We've always done it that way. And uh, that's, uh, and that, you know, all the materials I've talked about have been made that way. So, you know, copper, you add a small amount of tin to make a bronze. Iron, you add a small amount of carbon to make uh, a, st uh, a, a cast iron or a steel. Um, you, uh, silicon, you, you add a small amounts of aluminium and uh, phosphorus and so on to get the functionality needed for the silicon chips. Um, and so on and so forth. They're all materials are like that. And um, I'll give you two, uh, two other examples. No, I won't. I'll, I'll mention those later. In, in the late 1970s, early 80s, in fact, I, just after I got back from, um, well, I had the idea just before I went, and I, but I began to work on it a little bit just after I got back from working at Banaras Hindu University, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I began to go around saying to people, why do we never have a multi-component alloying strategy and mix large numbers of components in large amounts? It doesn't have to be equal, but roughly, you know, large, large amounts of large numbers of components. Why do we never do that, I began to say. And everybody said to me, well, we don't do that because it's a crazy idea. You, you, it's, a, it's a daft idea, Brian. We've never done it. It doesn't work. You don't get usable materials. And... and uh, I couldn't get anybody to fund the idea, to do any research on it. Uh, my colleagues would discuss it with me a bit, but they all said it was not, not a sensible idea. Um, and I couldn't get any students to work with me on it because the students very reasonably wanted to work on topics which were, were, uh, which were modern hot topics, which meant they could get a, um, a, a job afterwards uh, because they worked on something which was already being used in industrial. Um, but, you know, I, I went away to India. I came back still keen to do this, and I managed to persuade. Oh, let me explain what I mean a little bit more carefully first. So if we have a three-component system, we represent it on a ternary phase diagram, as it's called, in a triangle. So you put the components, the three components, at the corners. And I'm going to give you two other examples now of materials developments. So aero engines depend upon nickel superalloys. They're nickel, so we put nickel here, with a, a small amount of aluminium added, or sometimes titanium, but usually aluminium, to give uh, strength. We put aluminium there, and a bit of chromium added to give um, uh, to give corrosion resistance. So we have a few percent. So we have nickel with a few percent of aluminium, a few percent of chromium. We represent this on a ternary system: nickel, aluminium, chromium. And any point in this uh, ternary region in this triangle is a different composition. And the closer you are to here, the closer you are to pure nickel. Here's pure aluminium, and so on and so forth. So our super, our alloys, which allow aero engines to fly, we allow them to work at the very high temperatures you need at, in the middle of an aero engine, are, are all in this region here. They're nickel with a certain amount of aluminium added along this axis, certain amount of chromium. So they've got a bit of both, and they're in this, this region here, this triangular region here. Um, similarly, if you want a window glass, we start with silicon oxide because silicon oxide can be cooled sufficiently rapidly to make it amorphous, which means that you can then see through it. But you add, so silica is the, is the one component here, but you add some sodium oxide to lower the melting point to make it easier to manufacture. And you add a certain amount of calcium oxide, lime, which is why it's called soda lime glass. And you add the lime to uh, give it a slightly better um, a stability because silica, silica, amorphous silicon tends to decompose back to being crystalline. Um, so you had a small amount. So you start with silica. You had a small amount of sodium oxide, soda. You had a small amount of lime, calcium oxide, and you're in this region here. So those are two other examples. But all of our materials are like this. They're all a single component with small amounts of alloying additions. If you look at all the possible ternary systems we could have, three component materials, we know very little in the central region where you've added even three components, just three components, in roughly equal proportions. We don't, this whole central region is largely not known largely. of the three component systems. And if you go to a four component system, which we can represent in a tetrahedron, um, again, we, we know the corners and the, and the near corner regions of this tetrahedron, but we don't, we know almost nothing about the center of tetrahedral uh, uh, four component uh, materials. If we go to five component or six component, forget it, we've never even made any of them. That's what I was saying. And people said, we don't do it because it just doesn't work. Well, they were wrong. Um, but let me go on. Um, 
everyone said, I got back from India and I wanted to do this, but no one would would, uh, would take it on. But a young man called uh, Alan Vincent, he's, his name's down in the right-hand corner here, um, was an undergraduate student at that time, and he was more adventurous than most students. And he said, I, I want to have a go at this interesting project. It's, it's going to be completely new. So he did a 100-hour undergraduate project on this topic, and that's where it all started. Um, and we first made up this material here. We didn't know where to start. So we just pretty much mixed up all the all the element, all the metals we had um, and, and semi-metals um, that we could thought we could melt together, 20 of them. So this this for a long time was the world record alloying material ever made with more elements than ever made. Five percent each, roughly, of uh, 20 different components. And we made it up and we looked at it under the optical microscope. And the first thing we discovered was it looked like everybody was right. This was a pretty rubbish material. You can see it's got lots of different phases and components in it. It fractured. We melted it in a, in a furnace under argon and we cooled it down. It fractured. It wasn't a very uh, useful material. So the first thought was, well, everyone's right. It was, why, you know, why have we done this? But the second discovery very quickly was everyone was wrong because this background black phase here turns out to be what's now known as the Cantor alloy and has become very, very famous. And the Cantor alloy is, it turned out, that, that region of that material consisted of just five components, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel, mainly five components, in equal proportions, 20% of each. And that region, so we then made up this alloy, the, Cant the original Cantor alloy. Um, and this material turns out to have a single phase, phase-centered cubic structure. That means that the atoms are arranged in a phase-centered cubic array. So here's a this is the crystal structure. Here are atoms in a face-centered cubic array, an atom at the corner of each cube and a, 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 the face center, and you can imagine stacking these up. Well, most metals have this face-centered cubic structure. It's why they're so soft and formable and why they're so fracture resistant, unlike most other materials. I'll say why in a second. But um, copper, gold, aluminium, lead, tin, not tin, uh, copper, gold, lead, aluminium, all have this face under cubic structure, silver, lots of metals do. It's why they're so soft and can be beaten out and, and formed into shapes. And I'll say why it's, again, it's, well, the reason is that the, is in this structure, the atoms can roll over each other by a very special uh, mechanism, which I'll, I'll mention later. And um, now this material, the Cantor alloy, consisted of 20% each of these five components, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel, distributed at random with atoms here. So instead of all the atoms being copper, or all the atoms being gold, or all the atoms being aluminium, 20% of them are chromium, 20% manganese, 20% iron, 20% cobalt, 20% nickel, at, um, in, in, a, in a disordered uh, random arrangement. Now, nobody could have predicted Nobody did predict that this material could exist. Only one of these five components has face-centered cubic structure, nickel, as its natural uh, structure. Um, and most, most metals don't mix so much as having five, as far as we knew. They don't mix. We, we've never tried doing it. It turns out they do mix. Um, but, but, but if you have, add binary and ternary systems, which we've looked at, you find they don't mix so much. And the ri we've seen that already. Copper, which is face center cubic, once you've added more than 1% of tin, it starts to form a compound. It's, it's, it forms a copper stannide, Cu6FSN compound, uh, Cu6SN5 compound. If you add carbon to iron, we've seen it. You get cementide, Fe3C, an iron carbide. You can't add elements into a starting crystal structure because you start to form compounds. That's why, and those, those provide the hardness for the materials we were familiar with, but if you add too much, it makes it almost impossible to make the material because they're too hard. They become brittle, they become they, they, they lose their formability, they lose their softness, you can't use them. That's why people thought it was a deft idea, a bonkers idea, to try and mix up so many components. But it turns out that if you mix lots of components, it gets easier again. It's much easier to mix five components onto a single crystal structure than it is to mix two components. If you take nickel and you add iron or manganese to it, it can't, it won't mix on this structure. But if you add lots of components, they will mix. And the reason is very easy to see. 
it depends upon the, the energy, the free energy, the Gibbs free energy of, of mixing of the uh, different components, the different starting materials. And the free energy of mixing depends upon two terms, the enthalpy or energy term and an entropy term. So the enthalpy term is the interaction between the atoms so, or, the, or the molecules. The, inter, the atoms and molecules interact to try and form compounds. This is the thing that drives the compound formation, the energy of interaction between the different uh, components. But there's also an entropy effect. Entropy is disorder, randomness. If you mix different things together, it's more disordered. So there's an entropy effect. But if you only mix two or three things, this entropy effect isn't that large, and the energy effect wins, and you start to form compounds. So in binary and ternary systems, once you start to alloy a bit, you start to form compounds. At first, that's good. You know, copper, you start to add tin, you get bronze. That's good. You start, then the bronze has a small amount of a compound, the copper tin compound, which gives it its strength. In the iron carbon, you learn how to control the cementite to give it its best strength in steel rather than in cast iron. But um, they're all, and because they're only binary ternary systems we've ever used, if you start trying to add more, it becomes difficult because they get, they get the compounds get to dominate and you and, and the materials become uh, difficult to make because they fracture too easily. They, they, they become difficult to use because they fracture too easily and you can't form them anyway in the first place. But if you add lots of components, the entropy, which is negative and therefore opposes the energy, the entropy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes formation of compounds and what happens instead is the the the, the, uh, the atoms and the, and the molecules mix on the crystal structure rather than forming compounds so that's why the cantor alloy formed now we published our paper for complicated reasons in 2004 nearly 25 years later i won't bore you with the details why it took so long and um, although there's an interesting story in it but we've published it finally in 2004 and just as before it was a complete lack of interest. My paper in 2004 uh, had eight citations. That means no more, probably no more than eight or maybe 10 or 12 people read it, and only eight people saw fit to refer to it in the first three years. It's now my most cited paper by a long way, and thousands of papers are being cited, are citing it every year. There are multi-million dollar programs in every advanced country studying these materials. Why? Well, let me tell you what first of all happened. I had uh, moved off in the beginning of the 2000s, to, as, uh, as um, uh, you heard at the beginning, to become a vice chancellor. I moved into university management. I was busy running universities, setting up research institutes, setting up schools, doing all sorts of interesting things like that. I wasn't really working much on science. But people began to ring me up. Uh, 2000, my paper in 2004 on this topic was the last one of the last papers I'd published before moving more or less fully into university management. But towards the beginning of the 2010s, people began to ring me up on the phone and say, what are these wonderful new materials that you've discovered, Brian? And what they discovered, we knew they would have interesting and unusual and exciting properties, uh, but they discovered this particular one. So this is the uh, a stress strain curve. You put stress onto the material and this is how much it, uh, it, it, it changes shape. And initially, it changes shape elastically. It, it doesn't. It, it requires a lot of force to change it elastically because you're pulling the atoms apart a little bit, um, and their 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 interaction energies uh, energies of of attraction are very strong. So you don't get much uh, much much uh, movement, and that's elastic uh, uh, um, deformation. And then with metals, they start to deform plastically. In other words, they start to deform and set with a with a set with a with a plastic uh, a change of shape. And that's that's in this region here. Now, if you have a ceramic or a polymer or 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 a, a metal which is too got too much alloying in it, they become very brittle. In other words, what happens is they they move up elastically and then they fracture. So you get a high strength, you go up to high levels of stress, but they don't have any formability because they just fracture the minute you try and change the shape. If you have an ordinary metal like pure gold or copper. That you, you don't have to hit, go up very very high, high up here before they start to deform plastically. The atoms roll over each other, as I said, if they're face centered cubic or even body centered cubic, but mainly face centered cubic. Gold, lead, you can and you can deform them a long way. You can get a lot of strain. You can you can change their shape a lot. 
So for the, the holy grail for materials scientists, for metallurgists and material scientists has always been how do you get high strength and high formability? The high formability, of course, also goes with fracture resistance because um, if because what happens is locally the materials begin to change shape and that, that that's rather than having a crack grow. Cracks can't grow and develop because you get local changes of shape. So formability and fracture resistance are effectively the same thing linked into the ductility. Um, so the holy grail has always been how do you get high strength as well as high formability? If you take a highly formable metal and strengthen it, the formability always goes down and you end up with a backlight with ceramics at a material that's got no formability and no fracture resistance, but, is, but has now a high strength. Well, it turns out the Cantor alloy has the best combination of strength and ductility that's ever been found. This is the original Cantor alloy. This is a slightly improved Cantor alloy. It, Cantor, it turns out there's more than one Cantor alloy. There's many of them. I'll show you that in a minute. This is a slightly different composition Cantor alloy. But again, a single phase FCC uh, structure with some similar uh, components with different composition. So these are just two examples. And all there's lots and lots of Cantor alloys with different compositions. It turns out they all have strengths in the range half to one gigapascal and ductilities in the range 50 to 100%. And that's the best of any materials going. Here's what's called an Ashby map showing the fracture toughness, the resistance to fracture as a function of the strength. And here are all different materials, glasses, uh, metals, ceramics. Um, and right at the top are the high entropy Cantor alloys. They have the best combination of resistance to fracture and, and strength, um, or formability and strength. Um, here is, if you home in on it towards that top end, you can see that here, and it's elongation now or ductility, but that also goes with fracture toughness, resistance, and also with formability and strength. And you can see the Cantor alloys are all here, and these are the best high, high strength steels we've got, which we can use. They've got the best properties of any material so far. So people began to take notice. And in 2010 or 2009, 2010, 11, the field began to take off. And there are now literally thousands of papers, thousands of researchers studying this field, um, and all because of what uh, this young man, Alan Vincent, did when he worked with me in 1980. Now, I said there's lots of uh, cancer alloys. Um, Murti, Ye, and Ranganathan, um, as an, it's an Indian audience, let me say two of those people are Indians. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Ye is uh, Taiwanese, uh, but the three of them uh, published, Professors Murti and uh, Ranganathan are uh, uh, in, at different institutes in, in India. Um, they wrote the first book on this topic, and they, they showed three pages. This is in 20, 2014, and they showed three pages of different counter alloys. Now, they updated their book in 2019, and there are now three or four times as many, maybe five times as many, uh, counter alloys that have been studied. Now, actually, there are way more than that. There are literally millions and millions and millions of counter alloys. If you remember the triangle and the tetrahedron with ternary and quaternary systems, if we imagine we can take uh, um, multi-component space, we could have uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 components. It's like having a 5, 10, 15 um, pointed polyhedron in multi-component uh, dimension space. I can't draw it, but you can see what I mean. Um, we're looking now in the middle of that, right? And in the middle of that, there's a massive region of face-centered cubic single-phase materials with literally millions and millions and millions of materials in it. But not only that, there are other families of materials. The Cantor alloy is just one family. Miracle and Senkov, Dan Miracle and uh, Oleg Senkov, uh, wrote a review in 2017 um, and said there are eight new families have been discovered. The Cantor alloys are only one. There's the Senkov alloys, which is uh, the equivalent thing with, with a body center cubic structure. There's a similar re region with a HCP structure. If you take an aluminide like um, iron aluminide, uh, FEAL, or nickel aluminide, NAIL, or chromium aluminide, CRAL, they all have the cesium chloride structure and a fairly fixed composition in binary systems. But if you put them into a multi-component system, you can have MAL, where M is a, is a whole bunch, five, six, seven, eight different metal components. You can have a multi-component aluminide. That's another with a single phase, all with 
the cesium chloride structure, a single structure, a random distribution of the metal at, uh, uh, atoms uh, on the cation uh, M site with the aluminium, uh, on, aluminium atoms on the other sublattice side. And each compound forms a multi-component region in, fa in, in multi-component phase space, so we can make up. So there's a vast region of each compound. You can have multi-component aluminide. The spinel structure is a massive region of which there's millions and millions and millions of spinels. The, and any compound you care to take. So there were eight when Miracle and Senkoff looked at it in 2017. There's at least twice as many uh, multi-component compounds and multi-component structures which have been discovered since then. So the number of new materials we're discovering by this method of looking into multi-component materials is the counter alloys were the first, and but there's literally, literally millions of counter alloys, and there's literally tens, if not more, we don't know how many, 10, 20, 30, 40, different uh, families like the counter alloys yet to be discovered and explored. They, we're only just getting going and doing so. So that raises the question, how many materials are there? How many materials are there that we, that we have uh, either looked at or, or failed to look at? Well, the answer to that is shown in the next two slides. Consider a system with C components. Consider a material that we make, a system with, uh, and we, let's say we've got C starting materials, C components that we can mix. Unless to say that a material is different, two materials are different, if we change the composition of the material by X percent of any of the components. We have to decide as to determine what, what makes a different material. So if, if, you know, if you change one of the components by X percent, you get to different material. That means that this N is 100 over X composition values for each component. Well, if, we, if, that's, if, that, if that's what we have, C components, with X percent, it's called the specification of the material, what, what, what specifies one material compared to another one. The total number of alloys and materials is given by this equation. It's a law of combinatorial maths. Don't worry about the details. Let's look at the out outcome. Well, first of all, how many components could we use? Well, there's 128 different elements, but a lot of those are toxic and radioactive. The noble gases aren't much use. If you strip those out, you get down to 80. And if, we, if we're really conservative and stick to the ones we're, more, we're mostly familiar with, there's perhaps, there's a, there's a, take a, as low a number as possible, let's say there's 60. We've got 60 components we can mix up to make our materials as elements. And what about the discrimination between different materials? Well, most materials are specified to 0.1 or 0.01%. So we'll be, again, and some to point parts per million. Our silicon semiconductors and our high strength steels and our high strength uh, nickel alloys are specified to parts per million to make sure that they're really, really high quality. But let's again be very conservative so we don't overdo, do overcook it and say materials are different if they differ by 0.1%. If C is 60 and X is 0.1%, the number of different materials we can make is 10 to the 100 for Google. A massive, massive, massive number, 10 to the 100. Um, for comparison, there's 10 to the 80 atoms we estimate in the universe. There are more materials, and this is a conservative estimate of how many materials we could make. It's almost certain we could use more components, and we, we, could, uh, we, we ought to perhaps be more restrictive in what makes one material different from another. So at a conservative estimate, the number of materials we could have is, in, is, is many, many, many hundreds of times more, many millions of times more, than the number of atoms in the universe. And how many materials have we looked at? Well, at a conservative estimate, it's 10 to the 12, it, probably even less than that, it might even be 10 to the 11. It's about half a trillion or a trillion. It's a minuscule fraction of the total number of materials. So we have millions of wonderful materials. This is my definition of gazillions to find. Now I want to explain how the counter alloys, these uh, very large extended solid solutions, with multi-component systems, some very interesting issues which are not obvious uh, at first, which lead to some of their most important properties. So look, here is a, this is not a real structure, it's a square lattice which doesn't exist in reality, and we just take an A to I, 10 different components, and just distributed them on a square lattice, just to show you what I mean. Um, and um, 
it's obvious that if all these atoms at the at the at the points of the lattice or the square lattice were the same, if they were all copper or gold or something, each point in the lattice would have the same properties. That's obvious. But here it's obvious that they won't have the same properties because some of the points have got an A atom, some have got a C atom, some have got an H atom. So there are 10 different atoms here. So you're going to have more different variation of physical properties from place to place. But it's more complicated than that because the number, the, the properties aren't determined by the atom alone. The properties of a material depend upon the atom and its first and actually its second near neighbors. So this A atom, the local properties here depend upon how this A atom re reacts with its near neighbors, F, I, J, and F, and its second near neighbors, those are its first near neighbors, and its second near neighbors, C, C, G, and D. Well, the number of clusters you can have is much bigger than just 10. So this C atom is surrounded by a certain arrangement, and this C atom is surrounded by a completely different arrangement, and this one is surrounded by a different arrangement again. So the question is, how many different clusters of atoms are there? Because that determines how consistent the properties are from one place to another. I'll return to that point in a second. But notice also on this simple way of looking at it, that each of these places, each of these atoms has a different size and a different electronic structure. The most, the most fundamental property is the size of the atom and its electronic structure. And they're different. Um, and how they interact will affect the local size and electronic structure in this region. So for each of these different arrangements of atoms with their first and second near neighbors, you've got a different size. And this strains and, and misshapes the lattice. The lattice isn't a perfect square. If every atom is copper or gold or, or aluminum or silver, if everyone is A or B or C, every lattice point is equivalent and the, and the lattice is a perfect square. And if it's a face and a cubic lattice, it's a perfect face and a cubic lattice in three dimensions. But um, it's not now because these atoms are going to be, dis these places are going to be distorted because of the different size and electronic structure of the atoms at each point. So first of all, you've got lots and lots of different local environments. We'll look at how many in a second. And those local environments represent different strains inside the, la the, 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 the material. So we're going to look at how many of those local environments and, and, re and, and, dis and, and, and uh, structures are there, and then look at the local strains and see how it affects two of the most important properties of the material. So first of all, let's look at the number of these different clusters, uh, as we can call them, of, of, of atoms with their first and second near neighbors. If we take first and second near neighbors and take a five component system, it turns out there's this number, 20 trillion, just under 20 trillion lo different local clusters. It's an enormous number. It's because the, the, uh, in face-centered cubic structure, the number of uh, first and second near neighbors is a total of 19 different atoms. It's a lot of different atoms. And the number of ways you can have that with five components is 20 trillion. If you have six components, it's 600 trillion. It's even bigger. The variation of properties locally is so big that you have to have quite a chunky bit of material to be able to, to sample every single possibility. So in order for, for uh, five components, um, taking first and second near neighbors only, 20 trillion local tr cl clusters, you have to have a material of about 20 microns in size for it to be an average material. To put it another way, if the material has a grain size less than 25 microns, each grain will have a different property. Um, and if it's 600 trillion in a six component material, it's got to be about half a millimeter in size. So you need a quite a big chunk of material. Otherwise, each bit of material is going to be different. What about the, uh, the local strains? Well, the simplest way to look at that is just to look at the uh, size of the atoms in their normal pure state. So this is the size called the Goldschmidt radii. And if you take the top five here, that's the five components in the, in the initial the original Cantor alloy, and these are their, uh, their atomic radii, and they vary by about three picometers. Um, so that's the size difference is about three picometers, which corresponds to about two and a half percent variation. So we would expect to find up to about two and a half percent local distortion. Now, this is very simplistic. The atoms will change their size locally, 
it won't be the same as in the pure material. And so, and, and, and the electronics uh, aspects we're not taking into account is a bit more complicated than just the, they're not, they're not like just soft balls that can be slotted in. Depends upon the electronic interactions. But if, to a first approximation, we'd expect three, pico, three picometers of variation in, uh, in strain in the material, about two and a half percent. By the way, two and a half percent is a lot. If you, if you strain any material in bulk by two and a half percent, it usually fractures if it's, if it's uh, ceramic and uh, begins to deform significantly if it's a metal. You can't get that, you know, they, they, they don't strain that much easily. So it's quite a big effect. There's a big effect on the properties if you have uh, one, even one percent strain. Anyway, let's look at if it's true, first of all. Well, in the, in the, in the Cantor alloy, the five component Cantor alloy has been measured by synchrotron X-ray de diffraction to be four and a half picometers, just under five picometers. And it's been measured by neutron diffraction to be two picometers. So it's in the right order. So we can think of it like this. There is a few picometers of strain from point to point in the material, in these materials. And that leads to significant variations in physical properties throughout a material on a scale. It's going up and down of about 20 microns, if not more. You need a big chunk of material before you, you average over the whole of that variation. This affects two of the most important properties, which I shall just talk about. Um, the first one is what's called the diffusion of atoms in the material. D is the diffusion coefficient, which measures how fast uh, atoms can move in a material. The way atoms move at high temperature in a material is by what's called vacancy hopping. So um, as you could actually see just before in the square lattice, occasionally there's a vacancy. There's an atom missing. That's a vacancy. It's a defect in the in the crystal structure. And if there's a vacancy, an adjacent atom can jump into the vacancy, or the vacancy, you can say, can jump to here. It's really the atom jumping into the vacancy. But that, that can then happen again. And as the vacancy moves around, the atoms are moving around. So at, atoms move around in a material at high temperature because of this vacancy hopping. But when you have a material where every atom is copper, or every atom is, or every molecule is silicon oxide, <coughs> the, the, the vacancy hopping takes a place at a certain rate, but it goes through a consistent material. But if you have a Cantor alloy, then the local, the local strain opposes, this local strain opposes the atoms moving around and jumping into the vacancy because they're a strain which fixes them in place. So their ability to move around goes down. And that's shown here. This is the diffusion coefficient measured it's normally plotted as a function of one over temperature. So this is high temperatures, this is low temperatures. So the diffusion slows down. It's usually linear here. Um, this is for the Cantor alloy itself, two different Cantor alloys, these bottom two lines. And this is for pure face center cubic nickel, uh, nickel's face center cubic, and one or two alloys, which are binary alloys, which are face center cubic. And the difference here is about an order of magnitude. So the, the speed at which atoms move around is about an order of magnitude slower at all different temperatures. It's quite hard to get these measure these results, and the reason is, uh, measuring diffusion coefficient, we normally weld two two uh, two uh, materials next to each other and see them diffuse and measure the composition profile. But unfortunately, if you have a multi-component material, and um, those composition profiles are very complicated, and it's very difficult to abstract the diffusion coefficient, you have to do what's called tracer diffusion experiments. They're much harder to do, but they're the only really good ones you can do. And there's not that many have been done, but it's been done now for quite a lot of different counter alloys. And consistently, you find about an order of magnitude slower diffusion. So the atoms move around more slowly. This has very important effects because what the degradation of materials at high temperature or the degradation of materials um, under, say, radiation damage are determined by the ability of the atoms to move around. It's the moving of the atoms around that leads to the degradation of the material. So the, these materials, have, have, not only do they have those great mechanical properties that I showed you, they're very resistant to degradation. I'll say more about that later. But that's the diffusion. That's the atoms moving around by vacancy hopping, by the movement of a point defect called a vacancy. But let's look at the mechanical properties that I talked to you about, which people first got people first interested. I've already said to you that the reason face-centered cubic metals are so deformable, 
They're so uh, they're usually very soft if they're pure, and then we try and harden them by putting compounds into little bits of compounds into them. But um, the reason they're so soft is because face into cubic structure, the atoms can roll over each other, and that allows them to change shape. And the mechanism by which they do it is by the motion of a line defect called a dislocation. I'm not going to go into the details of dislocation theory. Some of you may well know it, but some of you may not have come across it. It doesn't matter. Just believe me, there are lines of defect, of disorganization of the structure, which allow the atoms to roll over each other. This is a, an electron micrograph showing a picture of each of these lines here is a dislocation. And these dislocations have started to move around in the material because it's been put under some, under some force, under some stress. And that's, these have started to move around and the material started to change shape. It's the movement of these dislocations that do it. Now, this picture is actually from the counter alloy, um, but it would look exactly the same if we looked at it for pure copper or pure gold or pure aluminium. Exactly the same thing happens. The dislocations move around in exactly the same way. You get the same levels of formability, the ability to shape the material, to turn it into the sh wonderful shapes of things we want to make. And you also get the same levels of fracture toughness, of resistance to fracture, because it's the local mo movement of these dislocations that prevents the formation of cracks and their, and, their, and their propagation and the fracture of materials. So we get the same levels in the Cantor alloy of formability and of fracture resistance, but the dislocations don't move around so easily, just like the vacancies didn't move around so easily, because they have to move through the local strains in the, in the lattice that I've already talked about. So because every atom is different in the lattice, uh, here's a dislocation line, as it moves, it gets prevented because there's local strains. That makes it have a wavy shape, and it makes it means that it, they move around just as they do in pure gold or pure copper, but they do it at a much higher strength level. That's why we get the great combination of strength and ductility. Here are, here's some pictures of some wavy dislocations to show that that is what happens. And this is the theory. I'm not going to bore you with the details of this theory, but there are th the strength of a, of, a, of, a, of a material like this, of a, of a, of a strength and metal, depends upon three components. It depends upon the difficulty of moving the dislocations in the first place. That's the thing that's changed. There are two other effects, what's called the work hardening. The dislocations interact with each other. That's called work, work hardening, and they change the strength of the material. And then the dislocations also, also in, interact with grain boundaries or, or boundaries between crystals in a, because materials are very often polycrystalline. They have lots of crystals in them. These two are exactly the same. doesn't make any difference whether you're dealing with a single component material like pure gold or pure copper or, a, or the Cantor alloy. They're, they're what's called Taylor work hardening and uh, Hall patch grain boundary strengthening. Those are technical terms. Don't worry about them. It's this term, the basic difficulty of moving the dislocations through the lattice and this is the theory. The theory tells you this is what should happen if every atom, every atom acts as a sort of strain barrier. Don't worry about the details of this. Let's look at the output. Here's the counter alloy itself. Here's again a modified composition counter alloy. The black things are the experiment, and the red things are the theory. And they give fantastic agreement with theory between experiment and theory. And this has now been done in quite a lot of different cases. So this is a good example of what's going on. So, what are the properties and uses of high entropy multi component alloys? And in particular, counter alloys? Well, the counter alloys are already been shown to have the best cryogenic properties, low temperature properties of any material known um, at, at low temperatures. So, they're being looked at to be used in, at, at low temperatures. I've already said they've got excellent uh, high temperature properties where you've got strong strength and ductility, uh, fracture resistance. But the Senkov alloys, the BCC ones, are even better. Um, they have great damage resistance, I've already told you. They have resistance of damage to corrosion and oxidation at high temperatures and of radiation damage, so they're being looked at to be used for that. That's the counter alloys. If we take some of those compounds, multi-component compounds, you can, you, you can, they have functional properties like solar energy conversion or high temperature superconductivity. But you can tune the materials for its functional properties um, if you uh, have a multi-component system. So they're being looked at for that too. Finally, they're being looked at for recycling and reuse because, you know, 
10 percent, uh, between 10 and 20 percent of all greenhouse gases are caused by the, the metal, manufacture of metals and metal products. Um, and we can't do without them. So we have to do what's called recycle and reuse them much more effectively. So we stop digging them up and, uh, and wasting loads of energy and creating loads of greenhouse gases and pollution in the manufacture of the materials and of, of the products from the metals. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to have to start having more generic alloys. Instead of having a very special alloy for each different material, each different uh, use, we're going to have to have a more generic alloy with more alloy elements in it, which will allow it to be used for more different things, because it's got all the properties in one material. And it will also have picked up lots of impurities because it's been recycled a lot. So that's what that we have a big program to study that um, at Brunel. So those are some of the properties. Now I'm going to finish with a little... Uh, presentation of three slides, which um, I came across when I was vice chancellor at the University of York. And uh, I had a very, very uh, good uh, head of the chemistry department called Paul Walton, who was a very good lecturer at schools. And he used to go around giving lectures at schools. And he worked on metals and their and their impact on, on the body, how metals changed uh, 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 the, the how they affected your body, anybody's body. Um, but he used to go around and talk about this at schools and he used to show school and I, I saw him doing this once and I said, that's great. I must because this this makes a real good point about multi-component materials. So what he would do is he would put up a slide like this and uh, this was for school children, maybe aged 10 or 11 or something like that uh, or 12. And he'd say, who knows what this is? Who knows what material this is? And at that age, they probably would know. And a lot of them would put their hands up and they'd say, Sir, please, sir, please, sir, please, sir, it, it's carbon. And he'd say, yes, you're right. C is carbon. It's what we call carbon. And then he'd say, I'm going to give you a, a show another example, a slightly more difficult example. He'd say, does anyone know what this material is? And uh, they, if they were that age, they probably might have come across this. And some of them would put their hands up and say, please say, yes, I know, sir. I know what it is. It's water. It's a compound now. It's a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. And that's a, that's a liquid material called water, very important material. Um, and then he'd say, well, what about this one then? Do you know, does anybody know what this one is? And of course, none of them would know what it is, but I've given the game away because up in my top right-hand corner of my slides, I, I give a sort of name to each slide. And this is telling you it's the secret of life. This is the composition of your body and my body and, and actually most living things, but uh, mo most um, uh, animals' bodies, most animals have this composition. Um, and it's an incredibly precise composition. So roughly speaking, um, this, this, this means that one in a trillion atoms in your body is selenium, and about 10 in a trillion atoms are cobalt, and about 100 or, or so are silicon in a trillion. And they're very, very exact. If instead of one atom in a, a trillion being selenium, you have two atoms of selenium, you die. If you have only half an atom of selenium per trillion atoms in your body, you die. You need that one atom of selenium, but you mustn't have too, too much either. And the same is true for all these metallic components. That's why uh, the professor of chemistry was putting it up to make the point about the metals and their importance in the body at very low levels and uh, and and how to control them and so on. But for me, this, the, the exciting thing about this is this is a point in multi-component phase space, in the multi-component phase diagram. I showed you the ternary diagrams, of which were triangles. I showed you the um, quaternary diagrams, which were tetrahedrons, depending on which were the components. If we take our 60 components and make a 60 pointed polyhedron in 60 dimensional space i can't draw it but you can understand what i mean every possible material is contained in that 60 component 60 pointed polyhedron that 60 component phase space and a point in the middle is this one that that is a point in the middle and it's a very special point because it represents the secret of life and there are lots and lots of other very special points. Maybe not quite as special as this, but special ones that we simply haven't found. So my final, and, and 
more prosaically than that, there are literally millions of Cantor alloys that haven't been looked at yet. There are literally millions of Senkov alloys that haven't been looked at. <coughs> literally millions and gazillions of multi-components aluminides that haven't been looked at yet. And literally gazillions of mixtures of these in the intervening composition regions that also haven't been looked at yet. <coughs> so my closing conclusions are that pretty similar to my starting uh, messages. Human history is the history of new materials. All materials are mixtures of all the materials that are alloys. There are literally gazillions and gazillions and gazillions of materials, and we've hardly looked at any of them. So as a, a fourth message, there are wonderful, wonderful new materials to be found. If you're a material scientist, um, you are in the right field to make fantastic discoveries. Get going, and if you're not a material scientist, this is the best field to move into. So become a material scientist and start finding wonderful new materials. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful and uh, delightful talk. It was very nice to listen to you, and definitely it's a new uh, field that you have or uh, that you have uh, start uh, started, and uh, I think it will enlighten every uh, researcher to have a think that uh, what could be more uh, progressive way can be done in this particular field. Uh, so the, the session is now open for a discussion. If uh, anybody has any query, you can ask the question. Uh, this is Professor mm -hmm. Sneang Shupal. Uh, Dr. Sneang Shupal, uh, it is honored to listen to you, sir. Really, it is honored and I am thrilled to listen to your mm, talk and I learned a lot. So I have uh, certain doubts. Uh, sir, uh, can, I, uh, can I ask? Of course. Go ahead. So, so sir, please uh, advise uh, about the thermal stability of nanocrystalline cantor alloy. If suppose um, uh, long term annealing is going on, so that uh, sometimes segregation of nickel or manganese to gain boundaries, then the phase separation will occur. So, how to handle this kind of scenario and how to uh, help to get the, that solid state single phase? Uh, so that it should not compose, uh, decompose at low temperature upon long-term aligning. Yeah, good question. Um, well, first of all, um, let, let me let me. Um, maybe I should put my slides back on because <laughs> then I can uh, show you things. Wait a minute. Here we go. Put them back on. And uh, let me just go back to this this slide here. Okay, the structure of a material is def is determined by the free energy, um, and if it's an alloy, it's determined by the mixing free energy. Um, and the free energy of mixing depends upon, as I already said, the enthalpy or the en internal energy of the material, which is really the interaction energies of all the atoms. Um, which is the compound forming aspect. And the entropy, that's the desirability of the materials to mix uh, together in a single structure and form solid solutions like the Cantor alloy or liquids. Uh, you know, when you mix things up in liquids, you're making, you're making again use of the entropy, which then dominates over the interaction energies. Now, it's very obvious if you look at this, that if you go to low temperatures, because, because they're not on an equal basis. The, the balance between the compound forming enthalpy or energy and the solution forming entropy effect, the balance between those is not a fair balance. It's not a fair and equal balance because the entropy is multiplied by the temperature. Entropy, randomness, is more effective at high temperatures. Um, it, it, it has a bigger effect because it gets multiplied, the bigger the temperature, this term gets bigger, whatever the ent entropies and enthalpies are. So at high temperatures, this term dominates, but at low temperatures, it gets very small. In fact, that's one of the most important laws of thermodynamics. There are, there are four laws of thermodynamics. The zeroth law, I won't bore you with. The first law, which defines the internal, the energy of a, of, of a material. The second law, which defines the entropy of a material. And the third law, which says that at, that at absolute zero, 
the entropy is zero. Well, it's obvious actually, because the entropy effect goes to zero. And another another def, another definition of the so-called third law of thermodynamics is that at absolute zero, all materials are pure, perfect single crystals. You can't, it's got to be perfect single crystal because you can't have any disorder, you can't have any defects in it. And they've got to be pure because if they're not pure, you've got random entropy because of from the impurities. So at low temperatures, everything separates out. So this, this term disappears at, as you approach absolute zero, and everything then separates out into a mixture of pure single crystals, pure compounds, pure components. That's automatic for every material. Every material is ultimately unstable to the mixing of different materials to make an alloy. So at low temperatures, all of our materials become unstable. It's not especially the multi-component ones, but of course you're quite right. We're relying particularly in the multi-component ones on having them mixed up. The key question is this, does that demixing as it's called happen at a sufficiently low temperature that it can take place kinetically? So thermodynamically, if you go to low enough temperatures, instability must appear but if it's a but if the temperature is low enough the atoms can't move so that it doesn't happen and that's that's precisely we make use of that already with all our steels we make most of our things out of steel steel is iron and iron carbide mixture of iron with small amounts of iron carbide iron carbide is in is unstable cementite is not a stable compound if you leave it if you anneal steel for long enough the the cementite becomes carbon. The, the Actually, the stable structure is iron, pure iron and pure carbon. And at low temperatures, it must demix to pure iron and pure carbon. And the cementite compound becomes unstable. Um, so uh, the same effect occurs in these multi-component alloys. Now, you're right. Of course, at first, people were, at first people were surprised because they didn't expect to find these multi-component single phase materials. They were surprised they were so easy to make. The reason they're so easy to make is that the entropy, I've already said, the entropy effect is big enough to dominate. But it dominates at high temperatures, for sure. But as you go to low temperatures, it gradually must still drop out. The question is, how low temperature will it go? So, so first thing, people were amazed to discover this counter alloy existed. And they were, first of all, amazed it seemed to be incredibly stable. You could heat it for long times. It stayed as a perfect FCC single phase FCC material. Then somebody annealed it for five years. I mean, it took five years after the discovery for people to discover. If you heat treat the cancer alloy for th actually three years, it takes, more, it takes more than three years for it to, for it to decompose into sing, in, into, into, um, uh, um, away from being a single phase. It takes more than three years at about 1,000 degrees C. So sorry, at about 800 degrees C. Above 800 degrees C, it's stable. It doesn't decompose. We've now we've now had enough time. It was you know people. It was discovered uh, in 1980. Uh, the first paper was in 2004. It's only began to be studied in detail in 2010. We've only had 11 years. So people only began to do these long-term annealing experiments a few years after that. So we've only just begun to understand. But people have done it enough now. Above 800 degrees it seems to be completely stable. So above 800 degrees, um, it, it's thermodynamically stable. Below 800 degrees, it's thermodynamically unstable. And there's a region between about seven, 600 and 800 degrees where if you kneel it for years and years, it will, it will, it will decompose. So that's the Cantor alloy. Now different, that's the Cantor alloy, the five component Cantor alloy. Different alloys will have different abilities to be stable. Some of them will be more stable than that, at low temperatures, some of them will be less stable. We haven't yet really studied it. So the answer is, we can use them, but we have to be a bit careful. But we have to do that with all of our materials because all materials degrade at, 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 in use and at high temperatures. I guarantee that because that, that's that's to do with the entropy always wins. You know, some there, there's uh, the famous uh, uh, argument that the world will all end up as dust in the end because entropy must win in the end. Everything ultimately must, must decompose into, in, into a, a sort of entropic dust. 
But, um, you know, everything decomposes and, and it becomes disorganized in the end. Um, so what we have to do is we have to, uh, you know, do the studies. Uh, it depends what you want. If you want a material that's stable over that period, it's going to be running at 800 degrees for that length of time for three years, then there's going to be a problem with the counter alloy. But there will be other alloys that will be more stable than that. Just like most steels are more stable than that, there will be other multi-component alloys which will be more stable than that. And we have to do the studies to find it, to find them. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I understand. Uh, Good. Sir, Any other uh, uh, another one question, sir. Uh, tailor, tailoring stacking fault energy can yeah. be a viable option for like other high entropy alloy. If we can tailor the stacking fault energy system yeah. for Cantor alloy also getting better mechanical properties, it's a good option or? Absolutely. It's a great, great question. So let me go to this. So, so these are the. These are the dislocations I showed you here. And so this is actually, uh, this is, uh, I didn't talk about it. Sometimes in this talk, I do talk about it. This is uh, what are called two partial dislocations. Here's another example of two partial dislocations. And the separation between them is a stacking fault. Okay. The, the conventional dislocation in FCC, the, the most common dislocation, is a 110 half a 110 dislocation uh which which glides which moves on a 111 plane for those in the, who are who are listening and don't know about dislocations don't worry technical talk um but the particular there are different kinds of dislocation and there are a particular one which is relevant which is the one that gives fcc its softness and its fracture resistance and um, is called a half 110 dislocation and it moves on a 111 plane um and it also separates into partials because of the stacking fault arrangement. So basically, there's a stacking fault between that dislocation and that, that partial dislocation and that partial dislocation. The half 110 dislocation turns into two six 112 dislocations, um, and there's a stacking fault separating them. Now, in materials with high stacking fault energy, like aluminium, the, separa the separation is very small, and that and that affects the characteristics of the dislocation flow in the material, and therefore the uh, fracture resistance, and so on and so forth. And um, in in materials with a very low stacking fault energy, and a good example is stainless steel, then the uh, the uh, separation gets much bigger, and that that therefore has different characteristics of how the deformation and the uh, formability and so on takes place. So the formability of stainless steel and aluminium are very different because of the stacking fault. I'm saying this, you, I think you probably know what I'm talking about, but other people may not. Now you're asking me if we can tailor this. We can tailor it, but the most interesting point to notice is the stacking fault energy varies. The separation of these partials is determined by the uh, size of the stacking fault energy. If the stacking fault energy is low, the partials separate a long way apart because you've got a larger stacking fault energy. Um, uh, because you've got a low stacking fault energy, they separate a lot. And if they if the stacking fault energy is high, they, then they're, they're very close. But in, in our material, each, each atom has a different structure. Each locally is a different structure. So as you move along the dislocation, the stacking fault energy is different at each point is not the same everywhere. It was the same everywhere in pure copper or pure gold. So the partials are, are the same distance apart all the way along. But here they're not, they're different. Moreover, so that's the first thing to notice. First thing to notice is that the, the um, stacking fault energy is variable even in a given material, in a multi-component system, because of the variation of energy and properties from point to point, the thing I've already mentioned. So as well as I've already mentioned, you know, that the diffusion is variable because of that, the vacancy motion, the dislocation motion itself is variable because of that. And um, uh, but also the stacking fault energy is variable because of that. Also, the stacking fault energy is very important because it's related. The stacking fault energy is very similar to the twin energy. And at low temperatures in the Cantor alloy, the properties are even better because you get very, this is shown here, this is low temperature uh, deformation, you form twins. Twins are a more complicated version 
of stacking faults. They're, they're, they're related to stacking faults. And if the stacking fault energy is low, then the twin energy is low. So you can indeed tailor the twin energy to make deformation twinning a much more common deformation mode. You can also tailor them to make what's called transformation deformation. That's to say the formation of HCP from FCC. Another, deforma another def deformation can take place by regions of the material moving from FCC to HCP. This all happens. The twinning happens. The movement from FCC to HCP all happens because the stacking fault energy is low. So if you tailor it, and people have done precisely that. They have made what are called um, TRIP and TWIP, T-R-I-P and T-W-I-P, TRIP and TWIP multi-component materials by tailoring the stacking fault energy. TRIP means transformation-induced plasticity, transformation from FCC to HCP, and TWIP means twinning-induced plasticity. Those are the two effects I've just talked about. So you can get extra deformation modes, which give you even more ductility than and fracture resistance, because not only do you have the, the normal FCC um, dislocation behavior, the dislocation ductility, you also get the twinning and the transformation plasticity. And you can tailor all of that. And people have been doing precisely that. The, all the hunt is on right now to do all of that. It's a wonderful, you've jumped immediately to one of the most hot topics at the moment people are, are looking at different because that, that then depends upon the composition of the material and there's literally millions of compositions we can pick so and and who knows where to look we don't know where to look because our theories are not good enough to guide us you know our theories of these materials are very poor because all our theories are based on simple solid simple uh, two component binary systems and on dilute solutions not com complex concentrated solutions. So our theories are not good guides. So actually predicting how to tailor is it, we, we, people are working very hard to come up with new theories of what's going on in these complicated materials. And, and that's one of the hottest, hottest areas right now. Good question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, actually, uh, in future, I am working in molecular dynamic simulation. If certain questions, certain doubts is yeah. advice is required, can I contact you? Of course you can, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to listen to you and learn from you. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. And thank you, thank you for asking two very good questions. Any, uh, anyone else has a question? Uh, anybody else? Any questions? Uh, sir, uh, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm working in the field of uh, refractory alloys, uh, specifically in uh, high temperature materials. And uh, so uh, just for an example, that uh, high entropy alloys, if uh, the normal plasma facing materials used for nuclear uh, uh, reactors, if they yeah. want to get shifted, that, that is normally been made of uh, tungsten because of its uh, low tritium retention and it's yeah. a very high melting melting point. So what's, yeah. the, what's the prospect that uh, sh shifting from tungsten-based material uh, or high-temperature-based material to uh, high-entropy alloys where the uh, base material is not higher percentage? Well, uh, uh, so wh what will be the prospect? Is there any sort of degradation in the property or uh, with respect to high temperature, not only confined within this uh, plasma phase material, but also for uh, applications such as rocket nozzles, such kind of things, sir, if you can enlighten us, sir. Yeah, well, let me just give, I'll, I'll give an answer to specific, the specific question in a second, but just be clear as a general point, the, the most noted, the, some people think that the most exciting thing, people got excited about these materials because of the mechanical properties, and they got excited about the idea of a solid solution, single phase solid solution with five or more components in it. But, you know, as I've pointed out, the number of different materials you can make in the most important discovery is actually the vastness of multi-component phase space, of multi-component materials, the vast number, the vast, 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 ginormous number of materials that can be made. So the reason that's important, I want to emphasize it first, is to say that we're at the beginning 
of an, an enormous, you know, we, we've spent millennia, we spent thousands of years dis investigating simple binary and ternary, mostly binary uh, materials um, at low uh, uh, compositions. And suddenly there are gazillions more materials to study. And, and we, we need more, we need a, you know, another, we need millennia again to study them, unfortunately, because there's an awful lot of them. So we're only just getting going. That's the first point I want to make. We're only just getting going, even though we've been studying multi-component materials and high entropy materials now for about a decade, we still only just begun to get a reasonably good idea of some of the simplest things. Let me tell you that although there have now been thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of papers published in this field, um, I, someone once said to me that uh, three quarters of the papers or half of them or something are on, are on counter alloys, are on the counter alloy, just one alloy. So we've, we're only just beginning to understand one set of alloys. So if you take this, what's known as the Senkoff alloy, which is the equivalent for body centered cubic, it's vanadium, niobium, uh, tantalum, uh, tungsten, molybdenum. Um, in equal proportions. It's the sort of core of an enormous region of body-centered cubic phase space. Much less is known about it, much, much less. And if you take, like I mentioned, the multi-components of luminides or, or the hexagonal uh, ones or the larvae phases, uh, which have got e equally large regions or with incredibly interesting properties, they've har hardly done any experiments yet. So um, it's taking a, a quite a long time for this to all build up. but So let me make a few points, though, on your specific point about um, um, nuclear uh, reactor materials and, uh, and, and refractory metals. So first thing, I've already mentioned that radiation damage is, uh, is, um, is very uh, good in uh, high entropy materials. Maybe you know that. Um, not everyone will know it. And the reason is basically because of that slow down diffusion um, of the elements in the materials. This, now, the, the reason for that is to be more, a little bit more detailed is most radiation damage is not caused direct in a material, different with a body, but in a material is not caused by, directly by the radiation itself. The radiation damage leads initially to the form, what, what it causes is local formation of excess vacancies, which then migrate and form pores. That's what leads then to the fracture of the material. That's the problem. Um, but if the vacancies which are formed by the radiation damage don't move, they can't form pores and they're relatively benign. So the, so the, the, so the materials are much more resistant to radiation damage because of the low diffusion, the low speed of mo motion of vacancies, and, and, and which is really acid jumping into vacancies in the materials. Now that's true for all the components which you might want to use in a, in a radiation environment, like a like a nuclear reactor, for instance. Um, if you want to, um, the tungsten is used where you want to absorb the radiation because just to have a dense material, radio, tungsten or lead is then used. Um, now we know that tungsten can alloy with or many of the other early transition metals in a, in a solid solution body-centered cubic structure, which has excellent properties. Um, not as deformable uh, and not, therefore not as fracture resistant as the uh, FCC counter alloys, which are usually late transition metals mixed together, um, with some early transition metal added, but mostly late transition metals. If you take the early transition metals, vanadium, niobium, tungsten, tantalum, titanium, zirconium. You can mix these uh, in large numbers onto a single phase body centered cubic structure. So these have great potential for uh, both for uh, radiation damage uh, resistant materials, which are also radiation thick. I, I you know, absorb large amounts of radiation. Um, as well as they're being looked at for high temperature materials. I've already said the Senkoff alloys have actually got slightly better high temperature materials because the counter alloys, although they've got the best combination of strength and ductility, their strengths are still a little bit low for what you ideally want. So the Senkoff alloys have got higher strengths, um, but, but they're, they're trying to um, get them a little bit more ductile. Thank so you, another, sir. Another yeah, very thank good you. answer is yeah. yes. <laughs> yes, sir.
Thank, thank you very much, sir. Uh, anybody else? Uh, any question? Okay, so if uh, there is no question, I once again uh, thanks uh, Professor Cantor for such a delightful talk and uh, with so many newer things that we even are, as, as you have already told, sir, that we are uh, at the initiation point. There are a lot of uh, long way to go related with this uh, high entropy control alloys. So it, it will be a quite uh, nice enough that researcher will try to investigate more and more in this particular field and have come up with uh, very interesting ideas. So uh, thank you once again, sir, from your very busy schedule you have given us the time and shows are the uh, way uh, for uh, our prospects of uh, working research in a newer dimension, a newer field. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks once again. And thanks all the participants. Thanks our student members who have worked hard for setting up the webinars. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks once again. Thank you very much and good luck to everybody. Go and find some wonderful new materials. Thank you, sir. Bye to you all.